Once you do it, it's not about the numbers of how many people will come in and sit in a pew or a chair. It's how many lives are being impacted through the work of your local church. How many lives will be impacted as the hands and feet of Christ through your church? How many lives will know that when they are in a bind, they can go to your local church? Mission is about reconnecting back with the calling of Jesus to go make Christ-like disciples. We cannot make Christ-like disciples unless we as the local church are willing to go, to go locally and around the world to reach people for Jesus. Marcus Aurelius said, what we do in life echoes through eternity. What is your life echoing through eternity? Welcome to Echoes Through Eternity with Dr. Jeffrey Skinner. Our mission is to inspire, engage, and encourage leaders from across the globe to plant missional churches and be servant leaders. So join us and hear the stories of servant leaders reverberating lives as God echoes them through eternity. Brought to you by Missional Church Planting and Leadership Development in Dynamic Church Planting International. Welcome in to Echoes Through Eternity. I am your host, Dr. Jeffrey D. Skinner. What is God echoing through your life today? Folks, I am excited today. I have my friend and colleague, Dr. Desmond Barrett, that has joined us again. And the sun has risen and it has set. And as a result, he's written another book. And so, or published another article or has you know some other new accomplishment to add to his list of growing accomplishments there. So we have Dr. Barrett join us and his colleague, Dr. Charlotte Holter. And he and Miss Charlotte have, or Dr. Charlotte, have written a brand new book. It's a bestseller on Amazon for a while there. And it is called Missional Reset. And I have not had the pleasure to read it yet. We have been dealing with crisis after crisis around here. Um, but I plan on getting to read it. But I know enough about it and have read enough about it and skim through what I do have of it. And, you know, it's a really, really relevant topic today. So let's just begin with Dr. Charlotte. Tell us a little bit about who you are, how you, where you serve, and, and, and then we'll talk about the book. Okay, my happy journey. My journey began as a preacher's daughter. I've lived in seven states, and my journey has taken me to oh, all se- several places, but I went to Mid-American Nazarene University in, in Olathe, Kansas, met my husband in Pensacola, Florida, and we began our journey. He was a Marine helicopter pilot, and I went to college to become a teacher. And I did teach for 38 years wow. before I did. I got my doctorate in the during the end of that time. And now I teach for Liberty University and I teach education classes, which I it has fulfilled me to no end. I love what I do now. I teach online and I can still travel and do a few things like that. My other side of my life is I've been involved in missions for many, many years. Even as a little girl, I was involved in missions activity with Nazarene Missions International, as we know it now. And I have served in Virginia as the president of the Virginia District Nazarene Missions International now for this will be my eighth year. And I, we do lots of wonderful things. And I, I'm impressed. And, and Virginia just shines through their missions program, not because of me, but because we are just all about Nazarene missions. Right. And so those are the two big things in my life right now that I've shaved off other areas Mm -hmm. that I like, but I just can't handle it all. But my focus is Nazarene mission Mm -hmm. and missions in general and my work at Liberty University. So I currently live in the Shenandoah Valley been here for 21 years nice. and love it and life is good so there good thank you thank you for that that great bio of yourself there now virginia is phil fuller's the, still the ds up yep. there he is uh-huh. good. phil fuller's dad roy fuller was my district superintendent when i lived in alabama um, okay. and pastored in alabama 
In fact, I was ordained under his district leadership there in Alabama. And Roy has since gone on, as you know, passed on to the Lord and is looking down from heaven. I'm sure uh, is proud of his son, Phil, as he serves there faithfully and has served faithfully there in Virginia. How how many years? years? He has been, he's like one of the longest reigning DSs now. I think he's at 18 or 19 18. years. Yeah, sir. that's right. Mm-hmm. Well, good. And Desmond, now you served under, you served in the Virginia district for a while as well. Tell us a little bit. We've introduced you before, but go ahead and, and you know, maybe there's people that's listening to this for the first time, just getting an intro to you. Talk about your connection to missions as well, uh, and then where you are today. Thank you, Dr. Skinner. Yes, I had the pleasure to serving alongside of Dr. Holter, or really under her, when she was our district missions president, when I served as a pastor on the Virginia District. It was a wonderful opportunity to learn from a seasoned veteran. And this resource that we have provided really is a resource for lay leaders and church leaders who want to capture the heart for local missions in their local church. You know, we've come to a time and place where missions has been pushed aside as something maybe that's not as relevant as it once was inside the church. And we hope that this resource brings it back. And so our hearts, uh, mine as a former district missions president for the Kentucky District, also Dr. Holters as a current president and, and does wonderful things, we hope this resource really re invigorates the local church to reevaluate where missions is locally, not just internationally when we give our gift our gifts and our tithes. Yeah, and certainly we definitely want to get into the book there. Now, tell us a little bit about your background though. And so you served as district superintendent, you got your doctorate to recognize during university. You've pastored how long now have you been pastoring? Well, I've never been a district superintendent. I, I don't I know said <laughs> district missionary president, sorry. <laughs> pastoring a little over a decade now. I've served in Virginia and also in Kentucky, and now I've recently arrived at Winter Haven First Church of the Nazarene on the Florida District. And my calling has been in going into churches that have been struggling, that need a new mission, vision, and to recalibrate them and move them forward. And that's what I'll be doing here in sunny Florida. Not a bad place to do it in. And ultimately, my heart for local missions was called upon when I became a Nazarene in my early 20s. I had a wonderful woman named Rosalind Burry, who has now gone on to be with the Lord. She was in her 70s, and she took me under her wing, and she just began to encourage me about missions. And then another local missions president, Judy Binkley, who I dedicated my portion of the book to, she took me under her wings and showed me the basics of how to really throw a lively faith promise party, that sort of thing. You know, convention and and to make it come alive. You know, many times we think the things we do in the church have to be bland. And uh, Charlotte can tell you and can attest from her own leadership, it can be exciting. And what happens when people get that buy-in, their mind begins to shift. They they want to tell people about missions. They want to tell people about investing their resources, their time, talent, and treasure in the in the mission field. And many times I think our mission field around the world, and we need to continue to send our missionaries out, but it's also locally, and that's what our focus is on, focusing on how can we reach our neighborhood, our communities that have been drastically changed, that have been affected by drugs, that have been affected by broken homes, that have been affected by communities not commuting together, and so that's what our resource is about. So so it sounds like, Dr. Charlotte, that you guys are kind of reconnecting mission and missional Whereas we have unintentionally, I don't, I don't know that it was a an intentional design, but we we decided somewhere along the way that missions was about going over to some other country and doing a mission trip. We would we would take these trips and we would go to the Bahamas or we might go to Mexico somewhere and do a vacation Bible school for the kids and. And, and then maybe even plant a church while we're over there or work with some local leaders to plant a church over there. So it sounds like you guys are trying to recapture that original meaning of what it means to be missional. Talk a little bit about what it is to be missional and how it's connected to missions. Well, one of the things I think that inspired me to pursue writing this book was, and I don't want to say the book is all about the pandemic. It's not about the pandemic. But it, it, it 
came forth as reflection from the pandemic, meaning, you know, things got really shaken up yeah. after that time. And I think our society had to look deep within themselves and think what their purpose was and, mm -hmm. and how, 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 how do we change things? Mm -hmm. How, and we all know that churches had to make adjustments. Sure. You know, yeah. There was adjustments extraordinaire. Yeah. And, and and through this adjustment time, I think Desmond and I, we kind of talked about, we can't do it like we used to do mm -hmm. it. We just have to have to rethink this stuff and how right. to, how to make missions the goal, you know, right. I mean, that's what the Bible tells us. We, that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. I think that putting fresh ideas and revisiting some of the old stuff that we did trying to mesh those together into a, this is what y'all should be doing. You know, these are just some, you know, things that have happened and, and, and how, how can we make missions more effective? Mm -hmm. Desmond, you think that captures that or? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, just to piggyback on what uh, Dr. Holter said is that we believe everyone is called to be a missionary. You know, many times we, missionary is someone who has to go overseas. And we know today that missionaries from different countries are actually coming to North America, where we are becoming unchurched, where we're living in a challenging time. And the pandemic exposed that to our local churches, that we had wonderful programs, but we missed out on the local partnerships. And so we believe that everyone is a missionary, and we are called to look at the giftings, and we're called to look at the places where we serve. And then to go into, once training has been done, to go into our neighborhoods and begin to serve as the hands and feet of Christ. And that's where this whole genesis of missional reset, it's right. reset our minds, it's resetting our resources, our time, talent, and treasures in the local church to do both. And not just say one and done mission projects where we travel for a week or two weeks, but these are long-term partnerships that happen over a five-year span in our local communities, working with pregnancy centers, working with a local school, working with a homeless shelter, that sort of thing. Yeah, talking about the pandemic there, I think what it was interesting watching the church adapt in the midst of that pandemic. I remember the first Sunday that everybody was closed down and then, you know, churches were scrambling. They A lot of people didn't know what Facebook Live was. And, and you know, they're just so about a month later, you begin to see these these things pop up and come out. Okay, well, you can still worship here, you know. And I'm thinking, actually, we we worship is not something that happens in the church. When we become missional, what it when we are missionary minded, when we take the church, when we embody the church, when we exactly the whole intent in the beginning of of God was not that the church was the temple. But the church, our bodies are the temple. We are the church. We are the ones who are the hands and feet of Jesus as we go. And I think what happened with the idea of sending the mission of this idea of worshiping in the church and kind of sending missionaries out and that different people had a gift of missions and a gift of evangelism and, and to focus on that in that sense there and to combine with a professional clergy is that it became the job of the pastor or it became the job of the missionary president or it became the job of someone else to actually go out into the community. And, and so what I, I say is we kind of became mercenary missionaries. We paid, you know, in a wealthy, relatively wealthy North American context, we paid other people to do our mission work for us. And it, it became something that we did maybe one summer, we'd take the family or like you said, go on a mission trip somewhere and do something like that. I love your idea of working within the community there and taking the church within the community. And that is our worship is when we are doing that, that becomes, we are worshiping the Lord. It's not just on Sunday morning, but we're worshiping the Lord seven days a week in, in our lives and modeling Jesus for people. We don't, shrink back into the church as if it's a, a mighty fortress. The The song is a mighty fortress is our God, not a mighty fortress is our church, right? And so I love your idea of resetting 
and reimagining the idea of missional and missionary work to be outreach within the community, in reach within the community that where we're going in and and I was planting churches in Auburn. I worked with local pregnancy crisis center there. And um, they would give ultrasounds and they would give classes. I taught fatherhood classes to the, before I was a father, I was teaching (laughs) fatherhood classes to fathers there in Auburn. And it was just an incredible ministry there and a partnership with the church. It was just a a dynamic that fit naturally. You know, it was hand in glove. It was, you felt like you were truly doing the work of God. We'd go into the community in the inner city. And the vacation Bible schools there. And so I love your idea of taking the church within the community there. What are some other things that you have discovered in the process of writing this book and some other things that you want to highlight as you've done this? Some other ways that we're resetting the mission of the church? I have a couple of things I'd like to share. Sure. One of the things that has come to fruition just recently is we have a, an arm of the church called NDI, Nazarene Discipleship Ministries. And that used to be the old Sunday school and all that kind of thing. But we, on our district, we have decided that we really need to join hands, not be separate. And so yeah. this year, this year we get are moving into our district meeting and we are intentionally working with them Good. together not separate. Yeah. And we're doing our conventions together and we're getting the people, the leaders in each of the churches to come together. And we're going to have a really big discussion about how do we do this together? That is one thing. So that's one thing that I am encouraged by. And I think that, that, you, you know, partnering is, there's powerful. You know, that's a good title for a book. And <laughs> that's powerful. But and then you heard um, it here, folks. You heard it here first, folks. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I, can I, I just, next go book. ahead. Well, that I said I may steal that idea for my next book. Oh, so no, can, it's copyright now. <laughs> she, uh, we have it, we have it. It's copyright by Dr. <laughs> Dr. Charlotte here has a copyright. I'm sorry, Desmond, you got to come up with a new title. I do this all the time with titles. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to that's know. okay. That's okay. And it, I, is it appropriate for me to share my favorite yeah, part of absolutely. the book? Absolutely. Yeah. So, one of the things that I focused on in the book was children and youth. And mm-hmm. because I've been an elementary gifted teacher for all those years, I certainly have some insight, I think, on mm-hmm. that. But our children have to learn this mm-hmm. to become adults that do this. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that has happened as a result, probably from the pandemic, is the way we take up offerings and yeah. things. And just modern times say, you know, give, and then they give online. Yeah. And my grandson, they go to a church up in Leesburg, Virginia, and my it, my grandson was sitting next to his stepdad in church, and they were collecting an offering for a little gal that does their Bible quizzing, and she's a little powerhouse, but she was doing all of her her activity on her own money, and and she didn't have a lot of money, but she was just trying to do the missional things, you know, with her own money, and so the leadership of the church said, this little gal, Heather is her name, she does so much for kids and stuff and they they wanted to recognize her help her mm-hmm. keep continuing to do what she does so they he got up in church had her stand up there and they talked about let's bless her and so my son-in-law took out his phone and he got online and he was you know he put down i think fifty dollars or something mm-hmm. like that and my grandson was watching him do that on his phone and my grandson was just like flipped out, like yeah. the whole dollars. And then Nick had a change of heart and he said, no, nah, I'm going to raise that to a hundred. Well, my grandson just flipped out for like, you're giving a hundred dollars, you know? <laughs> you gotta... Well, that, it was funny, but I was glad he saw him. Do sure. That yeah. Because we don't take up offerings anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And kids don't see that physical giving, yeah. you know, that actual, put the money in the offering plate 
And I was impressed that we should do things that help us make help help us have the kids see giving. That was, you know, that is a part of mission. Right. And absolutely. Um, so I think it's a good thing to make that happen with our kids. It provides some opportunities or at right. least make them aware of what we do. Let them do the online giving, you know. Right. So, so yeah. that's my my two cents. Yeah. I, I, and, you know, it's interesting you said that because I was thinking this past Sunday when we were taking up offering and we were not passing a basket. It was just a, a mention. Oh, by the way, you know, you can give online. And I thought, you know, we, we've already privatized worship so much in North America. And now with the pandemic, now we've privatized another part of worship giving. And so mm-hmm. we no longer, you know, and, and again, we do these things unintentionally. We don't, you know, right. it was a response. Hey, we don't want people to get germs. We don't want people to get sick. So we're not going to pass a basket that, you know, has nasty money in there and checks from people handled by. I understand why we did it. Yeah. But. There's always a cause and effect and unintentional consequences. And one of the one of the unintentional consequences is now we've privatized another portion of worship. And there's our generosity and our giving. And that is such. I mean, we give out of gratitude. We give, and that is a part of missions, this giving of ourselves. You know, they Alan Hirsch, I don't know if you know have ever heard of him or not, but he's big in the church planting movement, written a lot of books. And I was reading one by him. Recently, here's the thing. Desmond's joining us back again somehow. Or another he we lost him, but but um, I think he's coming back. But anyway, um, he talks about a missional DNA or mDNA and kind of recovering that. But he said mission is the what, and incarnation is the how. Combine those, and you have what I Alan Hurst describes as the missional as a mission incarnational impulse which is one of the six essential MDNA of, apost- of apostolistic, excuse me, of apostle, of apostolistic genius. I could not think of, I could not think of the word there. And I think that's exactly what you guys are saying here is that, that we've got to, you know, mission is not a program. I love that you guys are combining that mission. I've said that for years that somehow or another we compartmentalized our church and said, okay, we got children's department, we got Sunday school department, we got missions department, we got the lead pastor, and we got a discipleship pastor. And it's one church. And I understand again why we do these things, but the unintentional consequence is that's the mission program and that's their job. That's not my job. I'm not part of the I'm part of the children's program. I'm not part of the missions program of the church. So I'm gonna teach the children. I'm I'm the lead pastor. So I'm going to, you know, I'll oversee everything, but, but that's, you know, the missionary president's job to equip people to do missions. And we'll do that on Wednesday night and we'll let her stand up and, or him stand up and give their, their little talk on Wednesday night once a month. And so they can get their credit and let them, you know, read their books and, and make sure everybody does that so they can get their awards at district assembly. But, but there is no, embodiment of the mission of the church there. So I love the title of the book. I love the theme of the book and and love y'all's hearts there. Desmond, what was your, Charlotte was sharing kind of her favorite part of the book. What was your favorite part of the book? I think the whole book is a practical resource for the average church member. It's not a theological drudgery where you have to go deep dive, but it gives you practical steps of what to do next. I think all of us want to reach our community. The question we continue to ask ourselves, specifically since the pandemic, is how do we do that? And so we talk about, in basic steps, gathering together, dreaming the dreams of who do we want to reach and putting our time, talent, and resources in that direction and not spreading ourselves too thin. Coming up alongside of where God is already doing the work in the community, such as at a homeless shelter or at the Salvation Army, and bringing in those individuals, those nonprofits, to speak to the local church, to train your local leaders, and then to send them out, not for six months, but for six weeks, and then reevaluating it, ex- celebrating it, uh, celebrating the partnership, celebrating what God is going to do and what God has done 
at the end of it. Also to pray over your church members that are going to go out. Again, we need to see our church members truly as the hands and feet of Christ. We need to see them as the missionary that's being sent out, not only around the world, and we need to continue to do that, but to invest locally in the nonprofits that are around. Many times we think we need a new program, and when really we need is new partnerships. We need yeah. to come up alongside each and every one of them, individuals in our community and corporations. And with Charlotte's story, what she was sharing is that even the youngest can be a part of these wonderful partnerships. Even the youngest can come up alongside and to help at some of these nonprofit organizations. Again, it can't be a one size fits all. It has to be multiple partners that you partner with. It has to be long term, but also given short term opportunities for people to say, this isn't working for me, to find other partnerships, but to engage long term in those partnerships, not one. And if we do that, we truly will reset the missional focus, not only in our local church, but in our local community. How do you go about equipping? What are some of the practical ways that you talk about doing this? How is it? Because I know one of the biggest fears within the congregation is, okay, they want me to go out and talk to people. They want me to go out and do this. They want, I was talking to a, a lady that I coach down in a Panhandle. She serves in Alabama, lives in Florida. So it's kind of a weird thing. But they just started a Nazarene soccer ministry there. And when she pitched it to her pastor, and we think, well, that's not that's not missions, but but it is missions. That's what I that's what I feel like you guys are trying to say in your book there is that missions is not just, you know, walking out and and you know, doing sidewalk evangelism or holding a vacation Bible school or doing a mission trip. It is a soccer ministry to the local community. It, it is a food pantry. It is it is a, a walk going into the pregnancy centers that you talked about there. But anyway, when she went to her church board, when and I was coaching her about her presentation to the church board, I asked her, I said, how do you define success? And I said, is it going to be one person coming to Jesus? Is it going to be engaging the community? Because these are metrics that you've got to determine because they were talking about doing like a, a three month trial. And I'm like, three month trial for missions. That doesn't make any sense to me. And so, anyway, I, I feel like that's, that's what you guys are talking about there. So, how is it that you communicate that? And how are the practical ways that you guys live that out and equip your congregations to do that? From my angle, I think it's really, really important to understand that missions doesn't look like it used to, you know, a traditional missionary, there's no such thing as a, well, there is a traditional missionary, but it doesn't look that way right. anymore. I mean, I've got, I've got missionaries from our district who are graphic designers. Right. Yeah. You know, they're not a, a minister. Mm -hmm. And I think with our children and with our youth, exposing them to that missions is not being a preacher mm -hmm. or a medical doctor, right. you know, that, that, the the image of that missions yeah. person yeah. has changed in, and had a look. And I also want to emphasize that we should never let those old missionary stories go yeah. to rest. There's power in, and I heard a story the other day about, <clears throat> I don't know if you know, Dr. Gary Streit, he was met all of that. And, he told this story about when he was kicked out of his home <clears throat> and had to leave because of his Christian faith. Wow. And it was a little old church up the road here, just not. And he talked about that he went to the altar one night to kind of get everything settled within himself. And there was a little six-year-old boy that was also the preacher's son that had gone to the altar. And they stood up and and talked about their experience and this little six-year-old boy stood up and he says, God has just called me to be a medical missionary. And Gary said, well, I'm glad he called you because he didn't call me to go to Africa, you know, but the story, it was funny, but, but this little six-year-old boy became a surgeon in Papua wow. New Guinea and that? he just retired his whole, he has served his whole life as wow. a surgeon. Yeah. And, there's power in those old stories. Yeah. Now we don't live in that past, yeah. but we share those stories. Yeah. And I think just they stir your heart and yeah. they, you know, 
help you kind of to see what their focus was. So right. you're right. Yeah. yeah, you're right. I mean, we and even the Church of the Nazarene and 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 I don't know about other denominations and other organizations, but I know used to the Church of the Nazarene would if you're going to be a missionary in Papua New Guinea, they would they would give you this whole year of training in the language and the culture and and all these things. Last I heard, and you guys can tell me if they're still doing this. I, sh- I assume they still are. They don't. They don't give you that training anymore. They want to immerse you within the culture that makes you dependent upon them, which makes you for- forces you to create relationships and friendships with people. And, and instead of so in going in as a great white savior, so to speak, we go in as a servant. And mm-hmm. where it comes in as a graphic designer, it may be a nurse, it might be a surgeon, it, it might be a school teacher. We, we don't know. It, like you said, missions looks different today. It's not a pastor. It's living alongside the people there, which is really kind of what I mean, we I just I laugh sometimes because we think we're reinventing something and resetting missions sometimes. What we're having to reset is how we've reduced reduced the gospel in so many different contexts, and we're kind of recapturing what the other original thing was because that's what Jesus originally did was equip the disciples to go out and live among the people, and and work among the people. You know, Paul was a tent maker, um, not a professional preacher, so to speak. Right. So I love I love that idea. And you're right; it has changed, and your stories are so important because we live our lives in a narrative. We live our lives in stories. I I am one of the most powerful stories for us personally is one that Dr. Carla Sundberg tells about her when she was growing up in Russia. Yeah, it was Russia that she was growing up, and her grandmother and how she would, or it was like, what even her grandmother it was like an aunt or a caretaker or something for her would sing to her. She traces that in, that entire story, and I can't retell the story here. Number one, don't have enough time. Number two, wouldn't do it justice. But the point of that entire story was she traced that all the way from her all the way to Cuba where my wife was serving, and when we were in Alabama, she served as a missionary president there for three years, I think it was, while we were in Alabama as a district missionary president. She traced it all the way back to Alabama where we, where we were serving there, and then we could trace it from there to the church that we were planting where we had ran the local impact team for the district. And there was a, a, a young man, Jacob Morris, on that, impact team who was called to preach. He went to Treveca, connected with Dr. Kathy Mulry at Treveca Nazarene University there. Him and several other missionaries were, this was back during the, there was a war going on. This was, this was 11, 12 years ago. And you remember the story of the little boy that washed up on the shore of the of the beach there in I think it was in Florida that he washed up on the beach and there were some shoes that had some shoes on that they they showed on television and Jacob at this point was married and was serving in Ukraine I think it was it's before the Ukrainian war he was serving over there they were using that as a launch point and that's where Carla and all her folks were connected over there we could trace that story all the way to Jacob and his wife and several Treveca students who ended up seeing the red shoes on that little boy and were called to serve over and, and went to Kathy Mulry and said, hey, we, we feel like the Lord is calling us over there. And that little Cuban boy was connected all the way back to the original story of <clears throat> Carla when she was she called it a Russian name. It was for her grandmother when she was singing to her. And so it connected all the way to Cuba, to Russia and Moldova over in that area there. Those stories are what connect us to everywhere. And those stories are what inspire us. And those stories are what serve as a reminder that 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 is who we are as the people of God. That is our that missions is not something we do. Missions is who we are. So I love the I love what you guys have written here. I love what you guys are talking about. What are any any parting thoughts that you guys have, Charlotte? We'll start with you, Doctor Charlotte. Excuse me. We'll start with you. Any last last thoughts before that you want to leave with somebody before we before we end the the production well, today? Yeah. Favorite conventions I did <clears throat> had the theme of do something, and we talked about the 
some things that we could do. So I think the book says, do something. Yeah. You know, find that something that works for you yeah. and to do it yeah. and don't be afraid. So I think that would capture and don't forget any of the age groups, you know, yeah. include all age groups. Yeah. All that. So that would be my party thoughts. Yeah, that's important for sure. <clears throat> Dr. Desmond? I think the biggest thing is that what you said about uh, this woman who wanted to start a soccer ministry. It's having a heart and seeing where the need is and going outside the box and doing it. Once you do it, it's not about the numbers of how many people will come in and sit in a pew or a chair. It's how many lives are being impacted through the work of your local church. How many lives will be impacted as the hands and feet of Christ through your church? How many lives will know that when they are in a bind, they can go to your local church? Mission is about reconnecting back with the calling of Jesus to go make Christ-like disciples. We cannot make Christ-like disciples unless we, as the local church, are willing to go, to go locally and around the world, to reach people for Jesus. Good. Very good. Guys, thank you so much for being on. Dr. Charlotte, please tell Dr. Phil that I said hello. Not the one on TV, but your district superintendent. (laughs) Uh, Tell him I said hello. Greetings from Dr. uh, Jeff Skinner. And Desmond, always great to see you, brother. Good luck in your new ministry there in Winter Haven, Florida. Uh, You are stepping into big shoes there, big role. Uh, But I know God has big plans for you. I know that that you're going to do well. And when's your next book out, Desmond? Tomorrow? Uh, I'll have one on, on, on confidence and leadership with Dr. Hobbs and Dr. Church. That should be out by the end of June. Wow. Look at you. Well, I'm, I'm still trying to work on my second book. So I, uh, <laughs> I'm about halfway done, but I've still got to get motivated to finish it up. I need mean, see when I was working with you, Desmond, you, you kept me motivated because I wanted to be sure that I always stayed ahead of you, but I, but you know, I don't have anybody to motivate me now. So anyway, you have to come over here and motivate me some, right? I look forward <laughs> Hey, guys, great having you. Great meeting you, Dr. Charlotte. And y'all have a blessed day, okay? Thank you. You can be a co-creator with God by helping to echo our guest voices, share our episodes with friends and family and on your own social media accounts. Give us positive five-star reviews. Uh, The more positive reviews we have, the more visibility we have, and the more voices that are echoed through eternity. We often invite guests who are serving faithfully year after year, often in anonymity in their respective roles in ministries. God sees them, and the reality is, is for a good kingdom leader, that's enough. Uh, We do not do what we do for the accolades of humanity. We do it because we're called by God. But I believe that God uses people like you and I to continue those reverberations and echo them throughout eternity. You can partner with God by liking, subscribing, writing a quick positive five-star review, and again, sharing those voices with friends and family and on your own social media accounts. Those reviews will eventually lead to other guests who have larger platforms that have more listeners who will then in turn listen to the show. And again, it further echoes those voices, which is The whole vision of the Echoes Through Eternity podcast here is to continue echoing those voices that God is echoing um, through eternity there. 